Hello and welcome to the American Cinema Foundation Movie Podcast. I am your host, Titus, and today I'm joined again by my friend Flag Taylor to continue our series on the movies of Polish director Paweł Pawlikowski, who is now at the peak of his success. His previous movie, Ida, our previous episode, was nominated for a couple of Oscars and it won the Oscar for Best Foreign Film. His new movie, Cold War, which we'll be discussing today, that came out in 2018 and won him a prize in Cannes, has also got him back to the Oscars. He is nominated for Best Director, which is rare and amazing. He's again nominated for the cinematography. Lucas Zal, we have talked about his work on Ida. He has again put in for Cold War a great performance performance shooting a black and white movie in a riveting way, much crisper than the previous one and more lively and just alive to so many different emotions as much as it had been quietly sustaining faith and moral seriousness in the previous movie, a remarkable achievement. So this is the time to talk about Pavlikovsky and introduce him to his broadest audience possible since he is already getting so much prestige in various festivals. The new movie we're talking about, Cold War, is a love story. Whereas Ida was about faith in God and loving Christ, this one is about love between mere mortals and it follows a couple going back and forth through the Iron Curtain in a shocking way that we rarely ever see at the movies. Flag, first of all, thank you for suggesting this movie. It's great to talk about all these things. Pawlikowski is our third Polish director. We've already talked about Agnieszka Holland and Andrzej Wajda. And now we get to talk about this guy and the attempt, which is what defines this last decade of his work, to retrieve the memory of the past of Poland, of his own family, of himself as a child. We'll talk about the ways in which the movie is autobiographical and to try to talk about the relationship between love and tyranny. Yeah, it's great to be here. Happy to talk about this wonderful director, Polakowski. And I really liked Cold War quite a lot. The performance by the main character, Zula, is wonderful and affecting in a much different way than the performance by the actress in Ida. One is characterized by this inner depth and utter restraint. The performance by Joanna Kulig is just the opposite. Zula is just full and bursting with personality and uses her feminine wiles to get what she wants and isn't, seems to be unafraid of anyone or anything for much of the film. But nonetheless, it's a very, very attractive performance. I think one that will uh, be remembered for a long time. So as you say, it's a love story. The plot of the movie revolves around Zula and this gentleman, Victor, who is one of two people who are in charge of a Polish folk music troupe. We first meet them in 1948 when they're putting this music troupe together. Victor and Irina, the other troupe leader, the female troupe leader, are having auditions to join the troupe. And we also meet this communist party kind of cultural attache who's overseeing things. We learn very quickly that Zula edges her way into the musical troupe by agreeing to inform on Victor. And then Victor and Zula fall in love fairly quickly. When they are in Berlin, Victor makes the offer to Zula that they should escape to the West. Zula seems to agree, but when the moment comes for Victor to leave East Berlin for the West, Zula does not join him. And so they're separated for a while. Eventually, they're reunited in Paris, and we see them together in Paris. That does not go well for various reasons, which we will get into. They end up going back, not together, but separately to communist Poland. So you get this strange instance, of course, of someone fleeing the West back to communism. And I won't give away the the end of the plot yet. Maybe we should build up to that. And so the movie is, again, a love story. It's about love and happiness, finding one's place in a foreign land. But it's also, I think, one of the more interesting aspects of it. It's about art and the extent to which art can and does transfer across cultures and languages. Victor is a very talented artist who I think sees that he can never achieve what he wants to with his art in communist Poland. And so he sees Berlin and Paris as a very attractive environment. He wants to encourage Zula to reach her artistic heights in the same way that he thinks it's possible for him also in the West. But I think we see that Zula, her art is somehow attached to being Polish and to the Polish language in a way that it maybe isn't for him. And so in addition to being about sort of finding personal love and happiness across languages and cultures, I think you have this meditation on how and to what degree art transfers across borders. Yes, that's very well put. 
the center of this movie is love of the beautiful, or rather its theme, and it shows up in these varieties. At the beginning we see beautiful music, and we see that it is indeed tied up in some strange way with who the Polish people are. There is the love of this beautiful woman, Zula, played by Joanna Kulig. She had only a very small role also as a singer, somewhat similar in our previous movie, Ida. It's obvious to me how her performance in Cold War will assure a career for her and we will hear of her again, just like the protagonist Tomasz Kot, Victor, he will get a career out of this movie as proven something that we rarely see. His very interesting and very attractive character and his moral drama is just so well done especially playing against, as you said, a woman amazing in her variety, in her moods, in her expressiveness, in her beautiful voice. It was hard to be anything but, as it were, a straight man to her, continuous knocking down everything that he sets up. But he did very well, and so I expect to see more of these actors and to see them in even more famous roles in future. Now Europe and to an extent America have their eyes on them. And it's all because of this strange story that starts with an ensemble of folk music. Our protagonist Victor, together with a woman whom we had seen as Aunt Vanda in Ida, uh, Agita Kuleja, they're looking for girls who are singers. I'm not sure that these Polish girls are looking to be stars, they're just looking to make a living. This is post-war Poland and it's an incredibly impoverished land. There's a lot of misery intermixed with the beauty of their songs. The songs themselves are not in fact free any more than the girls are. As you pointed out, one of the girls in the troupe who ends out being the breakout star, Zula, is uh, being blackmailed by the party to inform on the guy running the show just so that the party can have control of him. They're looking to put together a very famous thing, something with the future, something with international travel behind Iron Curtain, but not necessarily just. And so yeah. they need to have a handle. Yeah. Remember how important these cultural institutions would have been to the Communist Party of Poland, right? Because the Poles knew more than other people that uh, Soviet communism, of course, it has a kind of foreign feel. It's a source of oppression. And so to the extent that the party could use Polish cultural institutions and infuse their message with Polish culture, they thought that would help them make the population more compliant. Now, if they wanted to be smart about it and use genuine Polish culture, they couldn't help but use genuine Polish music. And so I think, as you suggest, some of the music at the beginning is quite affecting, especially when you see Zula and one of her, um, the other women who are auditioning, they stumble upon this quite beautiful old Polish song. Now, as astute as the Communist Party was, there's also an extent to which they are incredibly stupid because very quickly after they discover that they can use this folk music to their advantage, right, then they try to infuse it with proletarian messages and you get this wonderful scene with one of the cultural ministers who asks, yeah, these songs are wonderful, but can you talk a little bit more about the iron workers and the proletariat and Irina, <laughs> one of the troop leaders just looked up and says, you know, Polish people wouldn't sing about that and sort of dismisses it. And so there's a kind of funny tension between how the party wants to use these cultural institutions and the integrity of the cultural institutions themselves. Yeah, from the beginning, the communists are trying to use this thing, but it's got to be a genuine thing to be useful. It's got to sell the Polish people on Polish pride and therefore to make them somehow more willing subjects to the Soviets. The Poles ought to have been, since they had been first conquered by the Nazis who were monsters and were then liberated by the Soviets, but as we talked in our conversation about Katyn, they were the first of the peoples of Eastern Europe to realize that the Soviets were even bigger monsters than the Nazis. And so there's a lot of suspicion of the foreign invaders, but there's no fighting them. The Soviet Union is here to stay, and to some extent they're trying to use folk music because it's a distant past, it seems to be of the people, and therefore not elite or bourgeois music that the Soviets would have to destroy violently. And of course, even beyond that, one of the conceits of the Soviets was that unlike the corrupt capitalists, they believe not in plastics, but in culture. Like in Russia, the Bolshoi Ballet or promoting chess players, etc. Whether it was high art or popular art, it was supposed to be genuine. But as you pointed out, they cannot help themselves because what they really believe in is propaganda. 
their interest in the beautiful is entirely instrumental. And as you mentioned, this lady who runs the ensemble just disappears from the plot because she doesn't want to be a part of this. She's not going to be a stooge. But the man who helps her run it, Victor, was the very talented musician, he runs to the West. He can't deal with this corruption of art either, and he thinks maybe there's a better way. You can find freedom to do your art somewhere else. Just go to the West. Nobody's going to be terrorizing or killing you there. There is this very affecting scene at the picnic. What's nicer than that? Victor and Zula, by the side of a river, with the wind blowing in the grass, are whispering sweet nothings there in love, in the first bloom of love at that, and she tells him the truth, because she loves him enough to tell him the truth, that she's an informer. This is the only way for her to survive. She comes from a horrible situation, and it shocks him. It convinces him simply to abandon this world. If this world is not even satisfied to corrupt music or art, but also wants to corrupt personal love between people, It solidifies his decision to abandon communism for all the obvious, the right reasons, and to leave West. But it's not enough, because he loves this woman and he cannot let her go. And although her situation is far worse than his, and she would have far more to hold against the Soviets, she's not, as you said, ready to leave Poland. She doesn't feel that she could be herself after she abandons her people. And this makes for this entire drama we see play out in Berlin, then in Yugoslavia, and then in Paris. There is more and more suffering and bitterness to color the beauty of the picture and the beauty of the love between these two people. But more and more you begin to see what you mentioned, the soundtrack of the movie, these old popular songs. They're not particularly sophisticated, but they are incredibly affecting. And you can tell without knowing any Polish or reading subtitles that none of these songs, in as much as they are about love, are happy. They have a certain awareness of tragedy that is simply unavailable anymore in the pop songs of the West, so to speak. Maybe even beyond that has been obliterated, but you see it lived out in this movie. It's a love story like you would have seen in those love songs. The world is cruel. Life is full of misery. And love is something different than never having to say you're sorry, like the old uh, (laughs) love story had it. And so there's a great profundity in this and a way to put together the action, the actors, the cinematography and the soundtrack that's rare. And I'm pretty sure that just like the cinematographer is up for his second Oscar for a Pavlikovsky movie, so the soundtrack will become a great success. These songs are amazing. Do you think, just back to this question about why their love and their art in part fails when they're in the West, I'm wondering what you think about the reason that Zula does not join him when he initially goes to Berlin. Does that have to do with some sense that her art won't transfer? Or is that just, I almost had as a lack of trust, that she's not totally confident in his love for her, almost a kind of immaturity. But I think it's later in the film, when they're in Paris, that she really discovers that her art doesn't quite transfer and she's not comfortable singing these French songs, right? So that's another thing that I think the movie does really well is that shows her maturing in a surprising way. I mean, at the beginning of the film, she's a kind of unruly, spirited kid who does whatever it takes to get herself forward and meet success. She doesn't really have a sense that she's talented at all. And I think he sees that she's more talented than she has any I don't think she thinks, you know, more than two seconds about the fact that she has any talent, whatever. So how do you see the evolution of her character through this film? I think you're perfectly right. It's beautiful to see this young woman become an adult and against so much hardship, but at times it's hard to watch precisely because you think there was such an easy way out. Lady, just just run. You have no idea how bad communism is going to get. Just run. This is your way out. Don't look back. Don't bitch about it. Just do it. It's baffling to see this woman reject. You're in Berlin. You can get out. This guy is out and he's willing to offer you a new life. He loves you so much, he wants you to have freedom. And she says no. That is shocking. That's the sort of stuff you only see in tragedy. And that's what it brought me to mind of, of King Lear specifically. There's King Lear who's offering his daughter this perfect future life as the queen of a big kingdom and success. And all he asks of her is to tell a lie, to put up a bit of political theater in Act 1, Scene 1. And she won't do it. What the hell is wrong with Cordelia? Does not she realize that it ends up with all of them dead? Of course she doesn't end up. Who would ever realize that when you're young? The problem with Cordelia and King Lear is that he loves her and she knows it and she loves him purely. She will not put up with political theater. 
Hmm. And there is something like that in this movie too. You would expect that this young woman who's willing to become an informant, who has done terrible things to defend herself and who's willing to do anything to survive, what the hell does she have to complain about? But she discovers love with this man and it's already spelled out in that one moment when she tells him, actually, I'm an informant and I'm sorry about this, I'm never gonna harm you, but it's true. He's shocked by this, but then he's kind of willing to live with it, but he never appreciates what it took for her to tell this to him. To risk everything, the only good thing she ever had in her life, for the sake of telling the truth. She's not so the she's kind a, of woman who makes compromises. You think she doesn't go to Berlin with him initially because she has to risk doing something for this for the right reasons? That she can't handle this atmosphere when there's no, I don't know, pressure on her that in part determines her choices? That she's just not confident enough to choose this for herself? I think that's certainly the case, but it's only brought out by one specific problem, that she fell in love. Mm -hmm. Had she not, she would have done whatever it took to get to freedom, and if that meant going west, she'd have done it. Right. But not in this case. It's hard to understand, but it makes perfect sense, because if you have to go through difficult things, through misery, through the sorts of horrors she has to go through, there has got to be something to keep you human at your core, and that is not negotiable. Everything else may be, because the world may be miserable to you. You'd have to adapt. But some things aren't. And so her reaction to telling the truth and the man rejecting her is suicide, essentially. She jumps into the river. He goes off and saves her and they commit their lives and loves to each other. But he never thinks about the fact that this is not a normal woman. A normal woman would have never survived what she had to go through. Mm -hmm. And the woman who can't survive this is not going to put up with all the compromises of normal life. Yeah, she has, we're given to understand that she had an abusive father and has some kind of criminal record, so she has a very, very troubled past. Yeah, exactly. And he thinks he can wash all that away as though, you know, you cross the Iron Curtain, you're in the free West, America's gonna save you now, but, you know, you can't leave your past behind. He thinks he can, and to a large extent, it seems that he really can. As you put it, he's such a talented musician, he does as well arranging jazz or French songs or poetry for music as he did with those ensembles. He does not have much of a connection with Poland. His talent really does make him a citizen of the world, and it does prove that in a bunch of different countries, in a bunch of different ways, his great talent allows him to succeed. And people see, wow, this, what this guy does is beautiful, it's amazing, give that man a job, give that man a record deal. And he wants to dedicate this to her as well, to bring out her talent, as you said. But she's not all about talent, she's all about love. Mm -hmm. And that puts certain limits that end up looking a bit more like the limits of Poland than, you know, a transnational or global talent or love of the beautiful. It's not that she's strictly a Polish patriot or is incapable of seeing the bad in Poland. Certainly not. She knows the ugliness of it. But it's where she lived and she really does believe in the things that she grew up with, so to speak. They make up who she is. And a lot of the story shows that she does have to become a sadder, wiser person. That you can't be a bratty teenager mm -hmm. unless you want tragedy and you can just die. You can become Cordelia or you can become Juliet if that's what you want. Right. It's not what she wants. She's not fully insane. She's not committed to this idea that love is either pure or death is preferable. She really does love this man, but to some extent she can't control herself. And what's worse, she knows that there's no way of explaining herself. In the West, people are far more sophisticated and they expect all sorts of very different things. And there's no room for a simple-minded girl like her there. And nobody will care about what's in her heart. As shocking as the fact that she will not abandon this land of misery for her is that she runs away from the land of freedom. Yeah, she chooses Poland twice, right? She doesn't go to Berlin with him in the early 50s. And then I think it's the late 50s. She married an Italian, left, and sees him in Paris, stays there for a while, and then chooses to go back to Poland. And so twice when she's faced with this question about where to go, she goes back. Yep, and the whole movie is built on a structure of reversals, like she twice chooses against the West, he twice chooses for in Berlin mm -hmm. and Paris, and like she is incredibly intransigent about love and is willing to risk death, so he learns to be the same. Mm -hmm. That's something that I don't think Western audiences are ready for, and I'm pretty sure Eastern audiences aren't necessarily ready for anymore either. Yeah, he's confronted with the danger that he's put himself in in that funny scene in, in Yugoslavia. 
the cultural attache, Kazmarek, sees Victor, and they have this little brief exchange. But Victor soon realizes that Kazmarek wants to have him sent back to Poland. But I guess the Yugoslav communists are a little more lax. Victor thinks that they're going to send him back to Moscow. And they're like, no, no, we would never do that. We'll send you back to Zagreb, and then you can choose where you go. So they're not the militant communists that he thinks they are. Yeah, and he has to learn on the fly this shifting political geography and the alliances among communist lands. Yugoslavia is okay, although it's risky because Tito was not a friend of Stalin's. And of course, after the Stalinization, he remained Stalin in Yugoslavia. <laughs> and so he was no more a friend of Khrushchev's either. And that separation between the Yugoslavs and the USSR, including Poland, ends up saving this guy's life without his realizing it. But that's not the end of it. She rejects him there, but then she abandons him in Paris. And so he goes back to Poland for her and ends up in the damned Polish version of the Gulag. Right. And there you begin to see what the woman was all about to begin with. As he becomes like her, fully and transigently dedicated to love, at whatever risk, she becomes like him and begins to make compromises and suffer in order to save him. And I think just to speak about human experiences aside from the extremes of communist tyranny and totalitarian terror, this is not unintelligible. Anybody knows that you might get very angry with somebody in your family or your friends and punish them or complain or what have you if they do bad things, if they do not rise to a sufficient standard of moral dignity. Now, let such anger be faced with fear that a child or a sibling or a friend is dying and all those moral concerns go out the window and the only thing that matters is saving somebody's life. Mm -hmm. And love is always moving in between these two levels. Please, God, let him not die. And on the other hand, what the hell is wrong with you? Why aren't you better? <laughs> this is a complexity built into the difference between our lives as embodied beings and our aspiration in the beautiful to something better. In this case, we see it play out between people who could have maybe a drama in the West or a tragedy in the East, but who are jumping in between East and West. That's what makes the core of the movie so dignified. It's not just a love story. It's not just a Cold War story. It's a story about what is there that is more important than politics. It is a strange thing for Western audiences to see specifically, but you'd think that it is us exactly who would appreciate this because it is we who believe that life isn't reducible to politics. Mm -hmm. Of course, you should love your country and you should do right by your country. You should be a good citizen because it defends freedom and decency. And these are very important things, but that's not all there is to life. And your country cannot love you back in the way somebody else, a real human being in the flesh, can love you back. Yeah. That's what makes the movie such a shocking and a compelling experience. As I said about the previous movie, Ida, it's short. This one isn't 90 minutes either. But by the time you're done with it, it has worked your emotions in a way that is rare for movies to do anymore because it deals very deftly and astutely with all these moral questions. You don't need a very long movie or as we have now, series that last for a season to properly characterize people, to understand what is fundamentally human in their conflicts and to see why tragedy might hit them. Yeah, You're going along with, for the journey and it is heartbreaking and beautiful by turns and you see what the sufferings of love really are or what the true aspirations are. Again, we, we deal with the fact that Pavlikovsky is a Catholic, so the question of faith in relation to love emerges in this movie as well. And you could say that in Ida, the question of the love of the flesh or eroticism is marginal and love of Christ occupies the whole canvas. Here, the love of Christ appears only in one detail of the picture, but human love, with all its suffering and all its glory, shows up everywhere in the canvas. Yeah. It strikes me now, hearing you talk a little bit about Zula, that there's a parallel between Zula and uh, Krista Maria Zeeland, the main character in Lives of Others. They both have this self-doubt and this incapacity to trust their own longings and loves that becomes debilitating. I think in Zula's case, it's probably in part from her difficult and troubled past, but she can't trust that she can be true to herself and be true to her art in the context of free Paris. And it reminded me of this line in um, Cheswaz Biwosh's The Captive Mind, where he's talking about how difficult it is for artists in the East. In a way, they grow accustomed to the pressure in which they live in the East. And they use the pressure that is exerted on them to produce art. The quote is something like, to produce art without pressure and to trust that there's something in man that can produce art without this external force, that's an act of faith. 
And I think it's the case that Zula doesn't have that faith. Victor does, at least for a time, but Zula doesn't. And that's, I think, the difficulty that confronts the couple when they're in Paris. One of them trusts his art, the other one doesn't. Yeah, that's very well put, I think. A lot of that is true, and we've already covered the lives of others on the podcast with Carl Eric Scott, and of course you two have edited the book on the movie. That is another wonderful movie that has managed to win the Oscar and a big audience in the West that deals with the difficulty of staying human, staying true to love and friendship in communist tyranny. I don't think this is going away. The new movie by Florian Henkel von Donnersmark, who directed The Lives of Others and wrote it, also deals with the question of whether love could survive the misery that people are reduced to in communist and Nazi tyranny at that. This seems to be a concern with the, the core of human dignity. What will suffice to answer the longings of the human heart and will it endure faced with terror and tyranny? There's a suggestion in there that love within political freedom is never that serious because it's never really tested. Mm -hmm. There's probably a lot of truth to that, although one suspects it's not as easy as that because nobody expects out of love to be mutilated by a tyrant. I mean, that's, that would be insane. But then there is this other matter that you brought up that in communist times, art was a moral force faced with tyranny to try to tell the truth and to preserve the experiences that reveal to us our humanity and to articulate them for people whose lives were mutilated by tyranny was a gesture of moral heroism. There are lots of famous writers in the West, but most of them don't really matter for anything. And as our great friend Peter Lawler used to put it, there's a lot of Solzhenitsyn envy in the West. So Zhenitsyn terrorized the Communist Party in the USSR when he instead should have been terrorized by them. In the Communist Empire of Terror, artists were murdered for what they did. In the West, nobody gives a damn. Yeah. Your art doesn't matter. And let us bring a terrible but very important example. Think about 9-11. Why do we not have any serious art about it? Why does none of our great talent, whether musics or movies or TV or novels or whatever, feel able to speak to America about what happened and what does it mean and what are we going to do about it? Mm -hmm. There's no such thing. Yeah. So art really did have a moral force and a mission and a way to deal with people's longings that it has lost. Do you think Victor feels that absence in the West or is it the case that he goes back to Poland to find Zula because he chooses love over art. I think rather the latter. It's yeah. remarkable how this guy gets used to the West. Whatever music he's arranging, whatever stuff he's doing, he's really good at it. But none of it therefore seems that important to him. Yeah. In the beginning, you might think that he's part of an attempt to revive Poland as a nation after the Nazis and the Soviets slaughtered and tyrannized by appealing to the longings, the poetry, the music that stirs the souls of the Polish people and has for centuries. Or you could do jazz, that's fine. But surely there's a difference. He's a harder character to understand for that reason. He, and he could have been happy in Paris, I think, had he been successful in convincing Zula that she could be a successful artist in Paris, right? Doesn't he end up producing a record for her? Yes. Right? And so he ends up behind this record that is put out. You know, clearly it doesn't make Zula happy. It doesn't do anything for her. But I think if it had, then I can see that he would have been able to stay in Paris. Yeah, to him, success is evidence that we've made it. To her, it's the opposite. He thinks that he can reassure her by showing her how well he is adapted to Paris and that life goes on. Indeed, he had another girlfriend at some point because things happen, we're merely human. And they were never really married, so what's the problem? But this tears her apart. The more he gets used to life in the West, the more she feels that she can't trust him anymore. What if he becomes right. one of them, as it were? It's not that she has necessarily much against Paris or what have you. It's that they don't belong together anymore then. What it might have taken to reassure her that they would still love each other and it would be as serious as risking your life and as dedicating your life, more importantly, that's really, really hard to answer. That's why tragedy is tragedy. With tragedy, you know what the stakes are. Mm -hmm. But you can also look at our societies. Zula does live our tragedy. Did not in every Western country marriage go to hell? Did not people ruin each other's lives miserably in divorces, ruin their children, ruin their societies in certain ways? We try and do the best we can, but it's happened a lot. Yeah. Because it really well, is very yeah. difficult within freedom to know if anybody's ever serious. Yeah, I think now that you mentioned, I think she's really repelled. It strikes me by the way that the French treat these erotic longings and erotic relationships with such a cavalier attitude. 
doesn't she end up trying to uh, partake in it a little bit? Doesn't she sleep with uh, Victor's producer or manager or something or other? Dumb. She either does or lies about it, but clearly the intention there is to hurt him into realizing yeah. how seriously she feels endangered and to loathe herself. She doesn't think that this new life is decent, actually. And yeah. that's, again, something that might help people now to understand what our situation really is. I think we all love to hear about how people in other places, because they were poor or tyranny or because of misery, they suffered so much, but then they came to the West and they had a better chance and they made something of it because it proves how much better we are and yeah. that it's fine. It's nice. It's good being us and everybody else wants to be us. It's hard to listen to somebody who says, maybe we're screwed up. This is, of right. course, what Solzhenitsyn did. He went to Harvard and instead of telling America, pat on the back, America, you're great. Now kick this communist ass and let's go home. It's not Rocky IV. <laughs> Although, I mean, even that, I mean, even Rocky IV is about how terrifying success can be, how it can corrupt people. But that's what Solzhenitsyn told America. All this materialism think, might be an existentialist howl, might be nihilism in action. Nihilism I think that's, smile. that's the first time that Rocky IV and Solzhenitsyn Harvard address have been mentioned in the same sentence. <laughs> we, should just, we should just note for the record that that just happened. <laughs> so I guess we've done our job. <laughs> So also with this woman, her criticism of how fickle love is in the West is very serious. By this point, the movie has gotten to the 60s, a more relaxed mood, the sexual revolution and all that. Lots of people's lives were ruined by that and they didn't take any tyrant or secret police. People just did it to each other. Right. It's not the same thing as tyranny or political misery by any stretch of the imagination, but it too ruins lives. And this woman feels so scared that she runs away. The only detail about the movie and how beautiful it is, and I think it connects to an important plot point that you were just talking about with Zula, but I think the only time that Polakowski portrays Zula as even remotely comfortable in Paris is when she's in the nightclub and she's singing in Polish, right? But apart from that, she always looks like a fish out of water. She's in these cocktail dresses that she doesn't seem quite comfortable in. She's confronting Juliet, Victor's girlfriend, and they're having this awkward conversation. She's throwing the record that he's made for her on the street. You know, she just seems profoundly unhappy. And so then, as you say, she goes back to Poland. He applies through official channels to go back to Poland and is told, I think, by someone in the Polish embassy in Paris, you know, this isn't a good idea. You know, they don't want you. You've chosen the West over us, so you shouldn't go back. He goes back through some sort of illegal border crossing and, as you say, ends up in a labor camp. We see her visit him in a labor camp and she says something like, I'll take care of this. I know how to get you out. And she ends up getting him released by agreeing to marry the old corrupt party attache, Kazmarak, and they have a child together. So presumably she had to make this deal with Kazmarak to agree to become his wife in order to have Victor released. Yeah, here you see now her suffering and her compromise is up till now, everything that was good about love was that he was offering her a way out. Now it's her saving him, and in a way you can see that the indignities she suffers are far worse. To an extent, her irresponsibility and imprudence have earned this much for her, and he's more of a martyr than she is for love. He went to the gulag loving her. Colin, but she marries this ugly, ugly human being, just the slipperiest of characters, right? Yeah. Just speaking of the indignity of her marrying this man and having a child with him, that whole scene, it strikes me that the music was particularly silly and undignified during that scene. Was it like a Copacabana type yep, exactly. Thing? It was I that sort yeah. of song that she's singing. She's obviously drunk yeah. and hates herself for doing this, but it's yeah. what it takes to get her beloved Victor out of political prison. They are fully humbled in a way that they had never been before. Yeah. And suffering has taught them to behave like adults in a way nothing had before. It's a strange thing to think that suffering could teach you things, but there it is. Right. Primarily, you think it's an insane thing to do to risk your life and your freedom and all this stuff. Just don't. But yeah. people do act on impulse. And this is the political part of the movie that, you know, there's much that's wrong with our democracy. But one of the benefits is that people who act on impulse aren't usually destroyed for it. Yeah. They are not going to be punished in a monstrous way because of an ideology. 
therefore the motion of the movie ultimately is to answer what can justify the love that people have the thing that Pavlikovsky deals with is unusually Christian even for him these people end up in a holy marriage because it's the only thing that can tell them the truth about who they are and justify what they have been through and put each other through by the way it's not that they're without blame by no stretch of the imagination Mm -hmm. but this was already implicit in the first scenes we saw not just the suffering in the love songs from folk polish music but something else their own love affair how are you going to get any kind of worthwhile freedom in a world that has gone through the horror of nazi and soviet tyranny What does love really have to offer that's stronger than this kind of monstrosity? How are you going to survive? Their agony turns them to God. Again, you don't see this at the movies much, and it's certainly not popular with art movies, the sort of things that win awards in movie festivals or get Oscar nominations. But there it is. It's an amazing achievement by Pavlikovsky and a deeply affecting movie for that reason. Yeah, you think that the end, they, they seem to be contriving to undertake an illegal border crossing together, but then they end up going to that partially destroyed or mostly destroyed church, as you say, but they decide to commit suicide together. So it's a dark ending. Yeah, for sure. But there is that moment of redemption of trying to get married in church. You know, it's hard for people to be human, even in normal or decent conditions, without tyranny and the Cold War splitting the world and creating this new kind of fear worldwide. But especially in times like these, the questions about what makes human beings human, what makes life really worthwhile. The question in Ida was, could you still be human after you learn the horrors that people do? The murder and the desecration and the idea that there are no limits on human action. Could you still be human after that? And that is the central insight of conservatism. There have got to be limits on human action. Some things cannot be done. If you breach those sacred limits, you're not human anymore. You're a beast. And the answer to bestiality, historical and political and just personal greed or fear, the answer to that is something beyond humanity. That is to say Christ's salvation in the Mm -hmm. case of that story, Ida. In this case, the question is somewhat different, but not unrelated. You're not confronted with the horrors of communism. They are only at the margins visible or some of them just suggested, not even mentioned. It is mostly the fickleness of love and the crazy things it puts people through. Mm -hmm. Why? Why should you suffer so much? Why should you not just stop? What does love have to offer you if it's unreliable and dangerous and crazy? And again, the answer seems to turn around to faith. People want something that being merely human is not going to suffice. And in that sense, although political freedom is a good answer to political tyranny, especially if it's armed for war and confident, but it is not an answer to the deepest longings of the human heart. Yeah. I would say, maybe to try to bring out what you just said in a slightly different way, Ida discovers the greatest, deepest love, this giving of yourself and friendship to God. She discovers that sort of on her own, as it were, in light of the horrible truth that is revealed to her. But it strikes me that Zula and Victor really don't discover that, in a way, happiness can only come after this self-giving without reflection or or not without reflection but without doubt i guess they seem to think during the action of the movie when they're in these different locations that they try to test their love by happiness and artistic success and it always turns out that they can't have happiness and artistic success for different reasons on either their part but by the end of the film you know, they finally do discover this giving of themselves to one another without doubt without hesitation You know, by then they can only do it in the act of sacrificing themselves in this full sense of suicide. But that knowledge, somehow it was unavailable to them precisely because maybe of the temptations of artistic success and, and, um, I don't know, earthly happiness or something like this. Yeah, it is a strange thing to make sense of precisely because it moves. The first act is the East, the second act is the West, the third act is something else that deals with God and death and what it means to be human, irrespective of America and the USSR and their conflict. And at that point, things become very difficult to interpret, and they're not fun to watch either. But they are deeply impressive, and you cannot but see that there is a moral seriousness to this that applies to everybody. 
and that puts in question the easy promises whether they are of success or tranquility in love or the things that we look for on an everyday basis but we also suspect maybe they don't work out so much if we look at the world around us as you put it the question ultimately is what is unconditionally good Mm -hmm. that's again asking about the sacred or what commands are given to human beings or how could you live a human life to think about the story its spiritual character comes from the fact that it gives an exhaustive political picture the world was split in the cold world between america and the ussr and everybody else was just caught in between in some ways and they depended for liberty on america and for slavery on the ussr now the movie tests love and puts love on display in both cases and in that sense it attempts to be comprehensive about the limits of human powers human beings cannot will themselves into a happy permanent love however much they try it is a sobering idea it's part of the ambition of the story and you could say that music always tries to do this whether it's the folk music or the rock and roll or the jazz the varieties of music you hear in the movie all of them claim that in some way they are independent of politics that they give people access to a truth about human being that doesn't limit itself this place or this time or this form of rule or these tragedies or these opportunities but that somehow tells them what it really means to be human mhm but it would seem that none of them quite get there yeah i just feel that if she would have found a way to be true to herself in this western environment in paris if she had been able to kind of make a new act of self discovery there maybe she could have appreciated the givenness of his love for her but you know because she never trusted herself she couldn't trust him and that kind of profound um i don't know sense of herself only came to her after going through these horrible tragedies you know him and the gulag and having to sacrifice herself and marrying this utterly yeah. repellent character yeah so i think that this has to be compared to jane austen in jane austen's adult six novels nobody ever dies and people can get happily married not everybody ends up happy by no means but some can there are certain rules as it were for for comedy to work out you have certain limits on human experience now when once the horrors start you, you have to look for other standards you cannot have a romantic happy ending Mm-hmm. At any rate, this sort of romance, it's not fully in love with tragedy, but it does make room for tragedy in human life in a way in which few of our movies do. Well, then that's your point about Austin Wright is revealing um, because if you think about it, what you're suggesting is Zula and Victor would have been able to negotiate their self-doubt and their love for their art and make a go of it together had they had a stable set of mores and conventions upon which to rely in the east they don't have that right because the kind of tyranny that exists there has exploded all of the organic customs and mores and conventions and in the west they're sort of fish out of water they're not french so they can't rely on french mores and conventions their self confidence about polish customs just doesn't work there and so the mediating institutions that help Austin's characters negotiate the reality of freedom just aren't there. Yeah. And the absence of all that is too much for Victor and Zula to bear. Yeah. You could say that this is the difference between comedy and tragedy. Comedy doesn't push things to the limit, but it does so at the price of excluding certain ugly truths. And within decent communities, that can work out and lots of people have that experience. But when decencies are destroyed by tyranny, you play for tragic stakes and you see people pushing things to the limit to find the one trustworthy thing, something that will not be broken or betrayed. And this just that cannot end well. Mm-hmm. And Ida for all the ugliness of the ugly truths it reveals, has a fairly content and happy confidence in Christ. in this other movie where it's earthly rather than divine love that's at the center you can't get there you cannot have serenity mhm yeah i think that's true well flag thank you for joining me for another conversation i hope that our series on pavlikovsky entices our audience to see his movies and to look forward to his next polish movie limono which is now in production and i'm glad to have the chance to celebrate the renaissance in movies in central and eastern europe and to show people what great reflections on human being there are in these poets 
we have got to get on to Donner's Mark when we get the chance and to yeah. Agnieszka Holland's Mr. Jones about the Soviets murdering the Stalin's murder of the Ukrainians in the 30s. But for now, we have had the chance to talk about movies about love for a change, human and divine. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thanks, Titus. It was great. And yeah, I look forward to the Holland and the Donner's Mark when we get a chance to see those. All the best. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.